Hey everyone, welcome to Operations, the show where we look under the hood of companies in hypergrowth. My name is Sean Lane. Something that's always been incredible to me is the ability for organizations to morph and evolve over time. That company that you just joined a few years ago may look nothing like the one you work at today. Product offerings change, go-to-market strategies shift, personnel turns over, and in operations, you often have to help your organization through these seismic shifts. How you motivate and incentivize people changes, how you find signals of success within your customer base changes. I've wondered sometimes whether institutional knowledge is a blessing or a curse in hypergrowth companies. You're blessed with the knowledge of context and an understanding of why things worked or didn't work, but you're also cursed by the biases that these experiences and this context brings on your current and future decisions. Now, how about someone with 12 years worth of institutional knowledge inside of hypergrowth, along with a complex, ever-evolving go-to-market motion that spans across multiple products and a handful of different sales motions? That's what our guest today, Megan Gill, brings to our conversation. Megan is the VP of Sales Operations and Sales Development at MongoDB, the database platform company with over 29,000 customers that's been downloaded over 200 million times and went public in 2017. Since joining the company back in 2009, Megan has risen through the ranks and she now oversees one of the more complex go-to-market motions that we've ever talked about on this show. In our conversation, we're going to talk about the evolution that Megan has overseen at MongoDB, particularly their transition to pay-as-you-go pricing, how to forecast a consumption-based business, and what it means to have smoky accounts in MongoDB's territory planning process. Let's start, though, with hearing from Megan about those different components of the complex go-to-market at MongoDB and the role her team plays in these different motions. So I run sales operations and strategy, and we have a pretty complicated go-to-market. So we have an on-prem product as well as a uh, cloud-based product. And the cloud-based product is consumption-based, so customers can pay uh, pay as they go, kind of like the way you would pay for your electricity bill. Um, and then in terms of the different channels we have, we have a self-serve channel, so any software developer that wants to use MongoDB can rock up to our website with their credit card and start paying for MongoDB on their own. We also have a high-velocity inside uh, sales team um, which is a you know more junior um, sales rep, and they're primarily um, working with customers that have somehow engaged with us typically through our self-serve channel. We have your traditional enterprise sales force, um, which is globally distributed, working with customers out in the field. And then we also have a partner channel. Um, so uh, it certainly uh, has many different layers, uh, four different channels, on-prem and cloud, uh, all in one go-to-market. So it keeps my job very interesting. I would imagine. And like, as you have, you've been with the company for quite some time, has each one of those different go-to-market motions kind of developed at different points in the company's maturity? Yeah, it's it's interesting how MongoDB has evolved over time. So I joined um, coming up on 12 years ago. So I like to tell people I joined when I was 14. Um, (laughs) Noted, noted. (laughs) But uh, when I joined, um, we... We were solely focused on, you know, MongoDB is so the it's an open source database technology. We did not have a commercial version. Any software developer could download and get started with MongoDB for free. And then the first commercial product we offered was a uh, well, first we offered just straight support, and then we sort of built a set of on-prem tooling around MongoDB, which we called MongoDB Enterprise Advanced. So our first go-to-market iteration of the go-to-market was very um, your traditional software sale. And then about five years ago, and in fact, I'm wearing my fifth anniversary t-shirt of MongoDB nice. Atlas, um, which is our um, cloud product, was was launched. And that was when we introduced um, the self-serve channel. And that's really when uh, the go-to-market started getting pretty complex because now we had not just software engineers you know, downloading and sort of playing with the product, but people actually paying on a credit card um, and and using it, um, uh, uh, becoming customers without ever engaging with the sales rep. And so one of the reasons I ask about that is I would have to imagine that your kind of level of predictability for the stuff that was there when you started when you were 14 at, versus the stuff that's only five years old now as a product, like 
that must be very different for you from an ops perspective in terms of looking at the funnel metrics, the predictability, how you forecast, how you think about each of those business units, or am I totally wrong and you've got the whole thing nailed down? Um, well, it's definitely an evolution. So I'll give you um, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, in a traditional bookings based model, you could easily tell a rep, well, you need to generate X dollars of uh, qualified pipeline to hit your target, mm -hmm. and we're going to hold you accountable to that. And we built a bun bunch of uh, dashboards around leading indicators called metrics for success to track the reps against that. Now we move into a majority consumption based model, where a rep can close close a deal with no commitment up front and all the bookings happen afterwards. And how do I hold them accountable to generating pipeline when they're closing opportunities that have no upfront commit and the consumption happens over time? And um, uh, that is like an ongoing uh, challenge for us when it comes to, um, you know, evolving our go to market. OK, let's make sure we're all following along with this complex setup at MongoDB. You've got two different products, one on-prem and one cloud-based, and then four different go-to-market sales motions, a self-serve, a high-velocity inside sales model, an enterprise model, and a channel model. Now, when it comes to defining these metrics for success that Megan is describing, that sounds really challenging when you have consumption-based opportunities. What do you do when you have no upfront commitment? when you don't have a real opportunity value to put onto your deal, when you don't have a traditional pipeline target to go after in the first place? How do I plan ahead as a rep in that situation? And how do I, as sales ops, help the reps on my team to know whether or not they're on track to hit their goals? Yeah, I mean, now the simple, the simple first iteration is that we are um, starting to think less about the dollar value of the opportunity and more about the volume of opportunities that the um, the rep is driving. Got it. Um, or the you know the number of new workloads they're they're potentially driving. But then it has it, this all has ramifications across not just the sales reps but all of the supporting functions. So I also have the sales development team, for example, rolling up to me, and their focus they have been laser focused on generating qualified pipeline. So now they're like, well, our qualified pipeline numbers, are is that even the right number for us to be, to be focused on? Should we be focused on the number of opportunities that we're able to generate? Similar for marketing. Um, marketing sourced um, bookings, is that the right metric to measure marketing on? So it starts to um, you know, become a, uh, uh, a question for all the other teams as well. Yeah, that's super interesting. So I'm trying to think, to your point about these ripple effects across different parts of the business as you guys are making this switch to the consumption-based model. And one of the areas that I can imagine it has a huge ripple effect on is compensation. And so with both the complexity of the different four go-to-market motions and the on-prem on versus cloud version of your product, like there must be a lot of complexity in how you think about both the design of the comp plans and how you think about the types of behaviors you're trying to incentivize with your team. Yeah, the first the first challenge we had as we were trying to shift the sales force um, to um, our cloud based product. Um, in the first iteration, you know, we were basically selling commitments. Go and get your customer to commit to say buy a hundred dollars of Monty the Atlas. Okay. And this had a few issues. The first issue is that all of the cloud providers, um, I know AWS and Google and uh, Microsoft Azure, they've all conditioned customers to want to pay as you go. So customers were, would be pushing back. Secondly, it was creating, um, it was slowing down sales cycles because, for example, if it's a new application. We're having to go bring in a sales engineer, do a complicated sizing exercise to estimate how much they might the customer might spend. So it's as if you know your um, your electricity company, your utility provider would come to you at the beginning of the year and say, "How much are you going to spend on electricity?" And you're like, "I don't know. How hot is it going to be this summer?" And like you know, it's it's really impossible to guess. So um, we uh, we rolled out um, elastic invoicing, which is our version of pay as you go. But there was this inherent bias towards doing the commits because, well, that's immediately going to retire my quota. So we, what we wanted to do was try to find a way to neutralize whether a customer wants to buy on-prem, commit, or pay as you go, how do we make it all even? So what we decided to do is pay the reps and measure the reps 
on uh, for customers that are in the pay as you go or elastic invoicing model that they would get measured on the run rate of that customer at the end of the quarter. And in terms of implementing it, so the rep can close an opportunity at say zero dollars, and then we automatically spin off a what we call a run rate opportunity in Salesforce. And that updates every day with the consumption, and then it closes at the end of the quarter so that it can be tracking the consumption of that customer over time. And then that sort of makes it as um, uh, attractive to close a, um, a, a no commit customer as a commit mm. customer or even an, an on-prem customer. Because I would imagine if I'm the rep trying to think about the pros and cons of those three, the on-prem, the commit, and the pay-as-you-go, certainly some of that's going to be driven by the customer's expectations and, and what their goals are. But they're also, you know, in the back of their minds thinking about how this is going to impact the comp plan, right? Like, how do you help them to both understand and still want to, like, do what's best for the customer at the end of the day between these different plans? Because I would imagine that's a tough conversation to to always end up with like the right outcome for the customer and not just based on what the comp plan is. You know, it's it's we're constantly thinking about what's the right balance. Um, I think initially it took some time just for the reps to wrap their head around the concept of getting paid on consumption. And there was mm. we had to do a ton of enablement um, enablement around that. Um, and uh, we obviously pitched it as a huge benefit, right? It's, it's meant to reduce friction with customers. Um, it's meant to drive velocity, make it easier for um, reps to get a customer started. You know, we showed them data that once a customer starts using Atlas or cloud product, it's likely that they're going to, to grow and that it's very, very sticky. Um, so that was sort of the initial rollout. And then what happened was a few teams sort of, you know, uh, um, started having a lot of success with it. And that's, of course, when things really be, began to take off and it went, um, it, you know, became um, common throughout the org. Let's pause here because this structure is super impressive, both from a system architecture perspective, as well as a change management perspective. After that initial pay-as-you-go opportunity is closed, Megan's team is tracking consumption on a daily basis and then closing out subsequent opportunities on a quarterly basis. And that's how the reps ultimately get paid. I know firsthand that communicating any sort of comp plan, no matter how simple it is, can be an important and challenging task. And with all of this nuance, Megan and her team leaned onto the social proof that the peers of some of the people on the team were succeeding to help them spread the word about this model. I also think that the reps themselves started to see the upside of this consumption-based model. If we go back to the electricity bill example, what if that new customer that you just signed all of a sudden turns on their air conditioning for 24 hours a day all summer long. The deal you signed just got a lot bigger. And according to Megan, this type of model also drove more cross-functional collaboration amongst the teams because every moment there was an opportunity to potentially upsell that customer as well as potentially churn that customer. Now, with all this volatility though, as an ops person, I couldn't help but think about how hard it must be to forecast this type of business. So I asked her, Megan, how do you and your team do it? Um, I, you know, I wish I could say uh, we had this completely figured out. Um, I mean, if anything, I actually think the run rate customers are a little bit easier to predict, right? Because Interesting. we're looking at how much they consumed over the last 90 days. As we get closer to the end of the quarter, that just converges with the actuals. Whereas in the bookings model, it's very binary. Did we get the deal? Did we not get the deal? So, um, you know, at the beginning of the quarter, it's, it's usually a question of, um, will that customer expand and bring on new applications that will, you know, significantly increase their, their, their consumption. Um, but over, um, over the broad portfolio, like at the level I'm looking, which is typically at like the SVP or the CRO level, uh, it tends to be um, a little bit more predictable than uh, than the the booking side of the house. And so you basically, I would imagine, then have to basically end up with three different forecast models: one for on-prem, one for the bookings, and one for the consumption. So the um, the way that we do it, we have one um, well one consolidated forecast. But typically, the way the leaders think about it is they they say, well, I have this much in run rate. I can expect it to grow because historically it grows a certain amount, 
And that's kind of in the bag, right? Um, because they're already consuming. And then there's a set of deals, booking deals, where we're like, well, these are like pretty likely to happen. And then you have, you know, how much of the rest of it is, is um, you know, what's your upside? So it's a slightly different way of forecasting because you have to think about multiple different variables. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, I, I would say a lot of the sales leaders, um, they tell me that end of quarter is not as quite quite as exciting uh, as it was <laughs> in, in uh, previous iterations or MongoDB or in other companies um, because it's, it, it you know, um, by the end of the quarter, a lot of the, the elastic run rate deals, which are often the big deals, um, have already been accounted for. From a predictability standpoint, that sounds lovely to me. I, I, <laughs> that sounds great as opposed to, you know, hoping that the person's like Wi-Fi from their vacation house allows them to sign the DocuSign <laughs> on the last day of the quarter. Like that sounds much better to me. Um, I guess the counter to that, though, is that, you know, if you're looking at your annual number, then you have to be more strategic at the beginning of the year. How many new logos am I going to get on board that will ramp up consumption over the course of the year? And um, it's it's definitely a completely different mindset. So let's talk more about that, right? Because that's, I think, one of the other big ripple effects, right, which is how you all look at those existing customers and the signals that you use to identify that that hopeful, you know, future consumption increase, future expansion, wh- whatever you call it. One of the things you were telling me about is that you all at MongoDB have very purposefully made it very seamless for people to be able to use the product without really giving you a whole lot of information. And so I'm curious about the trade-offs there about how you acquire those customers in the first place versus that kind of annual dilemma that you're describing of having to actually understand what the growth of existing customers might look like. Sure. Yeah. So if we rewind back when I was 14 and started at MongoDB, um, the founders took a very developer focused approach and they wanted to have as little friction as possible for an individual software developer to get started with MongoDB. And that meant that downloading MongoDB had to be super easy Getting started, you had to be able to get it started started and installing and experiencing the magic of MongoDB you know, within five minutes. So that means we don't collect any information upon download of the open source version. And when we started building a sales and marketing team, um, many of the salespeople were baffled. They're like, oh my gosh, there are people out in the wild using our product in production and we don't know who they are. Uh, but that was a really deliberate trade-off because we felt like in order to um, in order to capture the massive database market, um, we needed to have as much adoption from developers as possible. So you fast forward to today and um, designing territories um, and finding the accounts that we think have the highest propensity is a big part of what the sales ops uh, function does. And so we look at a bunch of different signals. Some of the signals are uh, internal ones, like are they already using, like uh, are they uh, active in our website? Are they taking, you know, doing different activities, attending events, being part of our online univer- um, MongoDB University platform? Some of them are product signals, like, hey, do we have developers using the free tier or the paid tier? Some of them are external signals, like do they have a MongoDB job listed on their website or do they have um, people with MongoDB skills on their LinkedIn profiles? And we took all of that data and um, we, um, we actually built an internal application um, uh, to bring all that data together and present it to the sales leaders in a very simple format so that they could design territories and focus the, uh, their sales reps on the accounts that have the highest propensity to buy. So I want to focus on the very last <clears throat> thing you just said there, which was so that they, the sales leaders, can design these territories. And so this is always a very interesting dynamic in different companies, how sales ops partners with sales leaders to actually get those territories in the hands of the reps. And so in this scenario where you all have built something internally using your own tool to bring those things together, can you take me through like what you're actually delivering to them and then what they're taking and doing with that information? Yeah, sure. Um, And by the way, I should mention we built it on MongoDB, of course. There you go, Uh, of course. (laughs) A little plug for our product. So um, I I would add that it also varies by segment. So the this application that we built internally, which we call Argos, and 
Um, I cannot remember. It's some, I think it's a Greek, some Greek mythological creature with a lot of eyes. And the idea <laughs> is, is that we're giving um, the sales team visibility into all of this data in a single place. And so um, bringing together the data from um, both uh, matching up the data from Salesforce, from our product, and from these external data sources was a constant challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so that was challenge number one, how do we map and integrate all the data? And then the second challenge was presenting it in a way that the sales leaders could more easily understand. You know, a simple example is you build a Salesforce report. It's like I can build it by parent account or I can build it by the child accounts. If I build it by parent, it's too core. It's too, way, way too coarse. If I build it by child, it's way too granular and it's too much data for the leaders to work with. So being able to display the data to nest the sub accounts, um, to give the sales leaders the opportunity to um, flag accounts that they think have potential that they think um, have what we call smoke, as in where there's smoke, there's fire, so they can tag accounts as smoky. Um, that is like they're actually contributing to the data um, that we're using to decide how to build territories. The other thing I'll say is that territory design is quite different for our enterprise team, which is our field team versus our inside sales team, which we call our corporate team. Um, the enterprise team, you know, it's it's more of an art than a science, right? Like, I don't think that that territory management is something that can come centrally from sales ops because we have some accounts where we have a single rep assigned to that account. And it's all about the relationship the rep has, the skill set the mm -hmm. rep has, and the manager really has the best insight into the people and the accounts and how to match them up appropriately. And our inside sales team, which is much more high velocity and transactional, they're primarily focused on taking people with strong signal, companies with strong signal of already using MongoDB through all of that data that we have and converting mm -hmm. them and getting them onto an elastic invoicing contract. So in that world, um, you could almost think of an account as like a commodity and it's like, how many do we have? Let's make sure we get as many into the hands of our reps as possible. And uh, we've built a pretty good machine around that where we we come up with a list of accounts that we think look look feasible. We have a BDR a research team based in India that does a bunch of data scrubs to review whether or not those accounts um, meet certain criteria and do a little bit of manual research on them. Then those go into what we call the bullpen. So it's like a, a territory where it's like a holding place um, for accounts. And as people either disqualify accounts or we hire new reps, we pull from the bullpen to top them up. Okay, so I obviously looked it up and Argos is in fact a many-eyed monster from Greek mythology. In fact, his full name, Argus Panoptes, translates to all-seeing. And Megan may have glossed over this part a little bit, but the amount of work and disparate data sources that were required to pull something like Argos together was no small feat. I also absolutely love how they call the accounts that are showing signs of buying as quote-unquote smoky. It's just so good. Okay, anyways, getting back to what she said, the distinction that Megan made between the different segments is a really important one. If you're running a more enterprise style go to market motion, you probably want to follow her advice that sometimes territory planning is gonna be a little heavier on the art and not just the science. Meanwhile, if you have a shorter, more transactional sales motion or an inside sales motion, that's probably where signals provided by something like Argos are gonna be really strong indicators of success. And this last part got me thinking, does that mean that the majority of accounts going into the MongoDB territories have some kind of smoke signal already? Or do they still have a true net new motion in their territories as well? Ideally, we have a little bit of a, of a blend, right? You know, um, where you have some um, existing customers um, that you can kind of have um, some opportunity to upsell. Um, some smoky accounts and some, you know, real true hard headed or greenfield accounts. Um, the other thing that I think about is, you know, the incentives, because if I'm a rep, it's always easier for me to go and expand or milk my existing accounts or um, go after the lower hanging fruit. Um, salespeople are like water, right? They they go, they flow to the path, path of least resistance, um, which is the right thing to do. Um, but if we really want to try to expand market share, you have to make sure we have the right um, incentives in place. So in addition to um, finding them the right accounts, we also have incentives around new logos, whether it's um, bonuses, spiffs, gates to accelerators, things like that, to make sure that 
we're not neglecting the accounts that could have potential, but don't necessarily have signal at this you know exact moment. Got it. That makes total sense. And so kind of almost stratifying the incentives to continue to expand that market share on the signals themselves, right? Whether it's that initial pass, the pass that you're doing with the BDRs, like what good looks like or what the right smoke signals are, I would have to imagine took some time to land on in the first place. And like, is that something that you're still constantly evolving or how do you know what the right signals are? Yeah, I mean, um, I think we have a pretty good idea of what the low hanging fruit is. Like if somebody is um, hiring MongoDB developers and they're using they're using the free tier of Atlas, like that's a pretty hot account. I think yep. what's probably harder is the accounts that are say tech forward or um, digital natives that may not actually be actively engaged with MongoDB. Like how do we decide which of those to prioritize and where is the biggest opportunity? So I would say on the like low hanging fruit side, I think we probably have a, um, have a pretty good process, but I think it's still an evolution to figure out like which are the right greenfield accounts for us to go after. And to your point, I could also see that being more of that art conversation in the, in the enterprise, right? Like, do we have reps that have relationships here? Do we have a rep that's been in this vertical or this industry before? And I think that's probably the biggest pro of putting the managers a little bit more in a, in a powerful position when it comes to carving the territories. Is that fair? It is. And it also enables the managers to, um, it, it, you know, encourage it's it's a way for them to uh, reward and uh, reward the best reps and create a culture of meritocracy. So if you're a rep that's doing the right things, then, you know, you're going to get the next uh, hot account or inbound lead. Yeah. And I would also have to imagine it's less of like, oh, like this is the, this is the territory that I got from the company or this is the territory I got from ops. It, it, it puts a little bit more ownership on to, on the team itself. That is definitely the case. And the other nice thing about that is that um, it's because the managers have to look at this data and make decisions, they are also able to go to the reps and say, these are the accounts I'm giving to you and here's why I'm giving them to you. And then the reps also have access to Argos, which is a tool that we built and they use those signals to figure out how am I going to pipeline generate into that account? Like, hey, we gave you this account because we see that they are, um, you know, they have a bunch of, of developers using the free tier. That's going to be very different from we're giving you this account because we see that they are um, they are building their own software. They're digital native. They're in the cloud. They're a big AWS customer. Right. Like the the approach might be different. And to bring things back to the very beginning of our conversation, I would also imagine that that helps the rep do that planning that we were talking about, right? Of understanding on the consumption-based accounts, how much of my quota we anticipate to be taken care of from these existing accounts and their growth versus the ones that I need to go out and basically generate that myself to, to close the rest of the gap. Is that kind of how they do that planning? There's like a little bit of consumption-based assumptions and then those net new accounts as well. Yeah, and I think they they do, and they do um, an exercise on their sort of path to path to money or route to money um, based on the accounts that they have and how they're going to to prospect into those accounts. So we we have a bunch of templates in terms of how like basically walking them backwards in terms mm -hmm. of you know what do you want to achieve? Okay, then what do you need to do in order to to get to that end goal? Before we go, at the end of each episode, we're going to ask each guest the same lightning round of questions. Ready? Here we go. Best book you've read in the last six months? Well, best book I've read in the last six months. Um, uh, well, I recently reread the Oh Crap Potty Training book. Does that count? <laughs> I was going to say, I know you have two young kids, so children's books absolutely qualify. <laughs> Okay, but I should at least come up with a good business book, right? I mean, I uh, I think um, I recently reread, also reread uh, Crucial Conversations, which is a great book about okay. um, having difficult conversations. So if you're looking for a business book, that's the one I would recommend. We'll take them both. We'll take them both. Uh, favorite part about working in ops? Um, getting to solve lots of different kinds of interesting problems. Least favorite part about working in ops? Oof. <laughs> 
um, fire drills <laughs> end of quarter fire drills. <laughs> those are probably my least favorite, but truthfully, I also enjoy those because they're, uh, they're also typically interesting problems that I need to solve. I, I can strangely identify with that, right? Like, it's like, Oh, here's another one, but I kind of love it in, in a weird, weird, chaotic way. Um, it's satisfying right. to fix something for of sure. Course, <laughs> of course. Uh, someone who impacted you getting to the job you have today. Um, well, it'd have to be the CEO of MongoDB who, um, David Acharya, who said, Hey, why don't you take over sales ops? And I was like, sales ops. I don't, I'd never seen a comp plan before. So, um, and I asked around a few people, including, um, a pretty good friend of mine, um, uh, Giuseppe, uh, who is the now the CEO of a company called Site Tracker, and I said, "Do you think I should take this job?" And because he had been head of sales ops uh, at MongoDB before he went to take the CEO route, he's like, "You're going to be spending 50% of your time on sales comp." And I remember thinking to myself, "There can't be that much in sales <laughs> comp," <laughs> um, but little did I know. Um, but yeah, so um, uh, I definitely have to shout out Dave for um, thinking that I could do this job coming from marketing. And then the other person would be um, when I joined again, when I was 14 years old, uh, uh, was um, the founder of MongoDB who kind of took a chance on me and said, oh, you're smart. You'll, you'll be able to make an impact here. That's amazing. Uh, all right, last one. One piece of advice for people who want to have your job someday. Um, so I, I, this is not my quote. I think it's a Sheryl Sandberg quote, but, um, when someone asks you to join a rocket ship, you don't say what seat you just get on. So my advice to people who, uh, want to have amazing careers is focus on being at the right companies, because if you're in a company with great people, great culture, that's growing fast, there will always be opportunities to learn new things, try new things. Like I never would have guessed that I would be running sales ops at MongoDB, but because I was in this fast growing company, um, this opportunity presented itself. So um, that would be my my number one piece of advice. I feel like that's like such a healthy perspective too in an industry like ours where people jump around quite a bit and, and like you are just seeking out that next opportunity, even if it's within the four walls of, of the place where you currently are, as opposed to thinking that that thing has to be outside of, of where you're currently at. Yeah, I think that is uh, that is true. And I think, um, you know, I've seen people chase a title or chase a role and go um, uh, work at a company that's frankly not that great and realize, well, being, you know, VP of X at a, uh, a company that's not going anywhere is not as good as being, you know, a, uh, a senior IC at a company that's a rocket ship. So yeah. um, and, you know, I think the, the reason Sheryl Sandberg is a good example of that is like, She's had, she could be a CEO of any, Silicon, like so many Silicon Valley companies, clearly, but she's COO of Facebook and she's probably having a bigger impact um, in that role uh, than she could being CEO of another company. So, um, you know, that's my, that's my advice. Pick the right company. I love it. Megan, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. The last thing I'm going to say is that I'm hiring. I have lots of open roles. So if you're interested in solving some of these problems, uh, shoot me an email. It's just Megan at MongoDB. Perfect. Love it. Connect with Megan on LinkedIn. Apply for some of her gigs. Thanks, Megan. Thank you so much to Megan Gill for joining us on this week's episode of Operations. If you want to follow up with Megan on some of those jobs that she was talking about, head to mongodb.com slash careers, mongodb.com slash careers. If you like what you heard today, make sure you're subscribed so you get a new episode of Operations into your feed every other Friday. And if you feel like you learned something today, do us a favor, leave us a six star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, six star reviews only. All right, that's gonna do it for me. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time.